conversation with through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, we seek your permission because these are holy words and you're a holy God, Lord. And I put my sins under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. Cleanse me as I confess them now. And Lord, uh, let nothing hinder us from the word. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Okay, John chapter 1. One of the two which followed, John, which heard John speak, followed him. The disciples of John the Baptist was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first finds his own brother Simon, says unto him, "We have found the Messiah." That's Messiah, uh, Greek, which is being interpreted the Christ, the Anointed One. We looked at that, and he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus beheld him, talking about Simon Peter, and said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is interpretation of stone. Now, like I said, we're not going to, we could spend weeks on Peter, and our study of Peter will wait as we come across Peter in the Gospel of John. So we're not going to go off on the side with, with him. But Peter. He's also known as Simon, Simon Peter. Uh -huh. uh, Simon means uh, to hear or to obey. Cephas is aromatic for stone, as he said, interpretation of stone. Peter, the name Peter is rock or stone. And Jonah, Peter's father, is Jonas which means dove. And Omo is also the same name as, look at uh, Matthew 12, 40. And we're going to see this again by the end of this study, but Matthew 12, 40, it's amazing how we're seeing one man, one man's name. And what instance we have, we'll look at the scriptures. And I'll let just draw that conclusion because I can't draw any other conclusion. John 12, 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly. So Jonas is Jonah of the Old Testament. Jonas is the Greek for Jonah. And it's, so Peter's father's name is, if it was in the Old Testament, if it was the Hebrew, would be Jonah. But that's what we're going to look at for Peter now, and that's all we're going to get about Peter until we see the stories of Peter. And verse 43, John 1, 43. The day following, the next day, Jesus would go forth into Galilee. Now, Galilee is up north, Israel. See it, Galilee? And Jesus comes from Galilee, but he's not born in Galilee. He's born in Bethlehem. And, and this is an argument you're going to see later on in the scripture. And we'll see it in a few moments. Yes, Jesus came from Galilee, but he was born in Bethlehem. And the family moved to Nazareth. And he's not a Nazarite. He just moves to Nazareth. There's a town called Nazareth. And there's a group of people called Nazarenes. Two different stories. And people are going, you're going to see through the script, they're going to get confused that, well, wasn't he supposed to be born in Bethlehem, the city of David? Yes, he was. He just, his family just came from another region. So it would go forth into Galilee and find his Philip. And said unto him, follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip finds Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth. He wasn't born of Nazareth. It's where he lived. The son of Joseph. 
So now we run into a, we run into a new character in the Bible to study Philip. Philip it means uh, lover of horses. He's of Bethsaida, which which is said in verse forty four, which is also the same town of of Peter and Andrew. So the three knew each other. So when Andrew comes across and finds the Messiah that we looked at, I believe it was last week. He goes home and he gets his brother, Peter. And then he gets, you would assume, being the same residency, you would assume that him and Philip were friends. So Andrew goes and gets his family and gets his friends about Jesus. Now we look at Philip. Um, in Matthew 10, 2. Matthew 10, 2, about Philip. In verse 1, Matthew 10, 1. And when he called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the name of the twelve apostles were these. First Simon, there's Peter, which is called Peter. Andrew, we, we did Andrew a couple weeks ago, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip. There's Philip. Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, Lebedus, whose surname is Sadeus, Simon the Canaanite. So there's two Simons. Simon Peter, Simon the Canaanite. And then, I read down to verse 4 to show you Judas Iscariot. That's the one that betrays Jesus. Well, you look at verse 1, Judas had the power of unclean spirits and cast out all manner of sickness and diseases. Judas had that same power as a disciple. But the man we're looking for, verse 3, Philip, Philip was one of the twelve disciples. And he's brought by Andrew. So the first followings that we see in John chapter 1, the first followers of Jesus, are Andrew, Simon Peter, and then Philip. And then we'll pick up, we'll pick up a little bit on Nathaniel and more on Nathaniel next week, Lord willing. Um, John chapter 6, verse 5. Looking at Philip. I mean, we got to know these names because these names are in glory. I mean, we're in the realm today of, of people talking about po politics, and I'm not going to get it. Those names may not be in glory. We may not see them in heaven. I hope we do, but he may not. But the names, Andrew. We're going to see Andrew. We're going to see Peter. We're going to see David. John, uh, John chapter 6, verse 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, Philip, for he knew what, what he would do. Jesus knew he, Jesus knew he was already going to feed the 5,000. Here, here comes the 5,000. And Jesus is standing there. And the one he turns to, he turns to Philip, the one we're looking at, that was brought by Andrew. He says, Philip, we're going to feed all these. Philip's response Philip answered in verse 7, 200 pennies worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them might take a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, there is, this, there is a lad here which has five barley loaves, two fishes, but what are they among so many? Here is the Philip and here is the Andrew that takes us all the way back to John chapter 1. Philip says, Lord, and some estimate what Philip said, two years of income is not going to feed these people, even if they take a little bit of bread. Then 
Andrew shows up and says, well, there's a guy over here, a little boy, he's got five barley loaves and two fish. <laughs> they ain't going to do it either. They don't have faith. Neither do I. I would probably say the same thing. But <coughs> when we look at the, five, the feeding of the 5,000, the multitude, it's not Peter, James, and John. It's Philip and Andrew. And again, we've already looked at Andrew. Andrew brings the little boy to Jesus. But Philip is there, and Jesus says to Philip, Hey, how are we going to feed these people? And Philip's like, I don't know. <laughs> if we had all the money here, we, we still wouldn't be able to do it. Now, I don't want to say the lack of faith, but it is a lack of faith. But we're going to see a man grow, Philip. He doesn't remain doubtless. We'll just keep reading. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 21. Then same came therefore to Philip, well, verse 20, and there came certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feet. So here's the Jewish feast, and the Gentiles show up. And they come to Philip, they, the same came to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, that's Andrew and, and uh, uh, Peter's, desiring him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. So here's Philip, one of the, one of the disciples, the Greeks show up, and they walk up to Philip and say, Philip, we want to see your disciple. We want to see your master. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. Here's Andrew. They've got to be best friends because they're, they're showing up together. They live in the same uh, hometown. Andrew and Philip come up to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, these Greeks want to meet you. So Philip, and what we, we studied of Andrew last week or a couple weeks ago, they are bringing people to Jesus. When's the last time you heard Philip mentioned in church? Philip is a soul winner. And him and Andrew seem to be together. As I said, I'm willing to assume that they were already friends as disciples of John and even beforehand. They're the same city. John 14, 8. Now you ought to, many ought to recognize John chapter 14. And we'll start in 14, 6, just get some context of what's going on here. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I quote the air of Saturday. If you had known me, you should have known my Father. Well, Jesus is saying, I'm the Father, the Father is me. Not getting to Jehovah's Witnesses. And from henceforth, you know him, the Father, and have seen him, the Father, because you are looking at me, Jesus is saying. So yes, Jesus said he's God. Philip says unto him, so Jesus comes up with the great John 14, 6. And in John 14, 2, in my father's house are many mansions. Philip is right there, and Jesus makes the statement, I am the way, the truth, and life. Philip says unto him, Lord, it be Jesus. Show us the Father. After Jesus just said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. Philip said, well, show us the Father. Philip did not get what Jesus said in verse 7. He totally missed it. Like any Jehovah Witness would. Uh -huh. Philip says, oh, Lord, show us the Father, capital F, and it's the fight. We would be happy just to see the Father. Jesus said unto him, which would be Philip, have I been so long with you, and hast thou not known me, Philip? 
So Philip is walking, talking, living, eating, sleeping, and being with Jesus during the ministry. As were the other 12 disciples. When you mention the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, Philip is there. And Jesus is like, Philip, haven't you been with me long enough and heard me and listened to me? And when I just said, I am the Father... So when we mention the name Philip, we're not mentioning just some character that hanged out with Jesus. We, a man that lived with Jesus, walked and talked with Jesus, had the power given to him by Jesus of unclean spirit and, uh, and uh, diseases and sicknesses. That walked and talked with Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and Judas, and Matthew, and all them. There's Philip. And Jesus talks to him, turns to him, says, Philip, don't you understand? You ought to know by now, Philip. So that's remarkable. Acts 1.13. Acts 1.13. Now Jesus has ascended, ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. The angels have talked to him, saying, Why do you look up to, you know, up to heaven? As he went up into the clouds, so shall he return. And they're gathered together to start the book of Acts. Verse 12. Acts 1.12. Then return day unto Jerusalem from Mount called Olivet, which is Jerusalem about a Sabbath day journey. When they were come in, they went up to the upper room, where there were both Peter and James and John and Andrew. There he is, Philip. He's in with the eleven. Judas has killed himself. So after Jesus ascended into heaven, after the death, burial, and resurrection, for 50 days, Jesus is alive, walking around after his resurrection. And then when he ascended up to heaven to the Father in, in Acts chapter 1, after being, here comes Peter, James, and, John, and Philip. They're in the same room. And one of the things they will do, um, verse 23, Acts 1.20, they appointed two, Joseph called Barisus, Bar who is surnamed Justice, and Math Mathaniah. They're, they're going to pick a disciple to replace Judas. Philip is there and part of it. And no, they did not vote, they cast lots. Look at verse 26. And they gave forth lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. They didn't vote. And we talked about lots before. The black ball, the odd straw, the long straw, the short straw, however they did it. So, Philip is in with the eleven, and he's doing church business. Because the church is now. After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you have the church is started. And Philip is in the early church doing the work as an apostle. Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Acts 6, 5. the same pleased the whole multitude. Well, let's, let's start verse 1. Just one minute. In those days when the number of disciples were multiplied, there arose murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily administration. And when the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them, they said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, wisdom, 
whom we may appoint over this business. This is the first deacons of the church. Now notice the qualification for the deacon. Men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. You ain't going to find many deacons in churches today that fit that qualification. But there it is. There's your deacon. But we will give ourselves continuing to prayer. This is what be the preachers, the pastors, and to minister the word. That's the job of the preacher and pastor, the word of God. It's to be the deacons that run out and pay the bills and do the authority and give out to the church people, the members. Not the pastor. Boy, we got things all messed up today in the modern church today. Deacons have to serve the tables. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith that will die soon, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Parcuthus, and Nacor, and Timon, and Parthenus, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Annie. Philip comes to be a deacon of the church, and not a pastor. He's put in charge of the people of the church, not leadership in the church. That's not a demotion, because to be a deacon of the church and do the, the full service of the deacon of the church is a great responsibility, because you're helping the pastor be relieved of duties so the pastor can study and pray over the word of God and over the people so he can do his job. The deacons don't run the church like the Southern Baptists. They help the church. But we're not going to get into deacons today. So there's your deacons. Acts chapter 8. There are deacons in churches today because they're friendship with the pastor. There are deacons in the church just for position only. That's wrong. That's not Bible. I know many deacons of many churches I've been in. They are not filled with the Holy Ghost. They're filled with something else, but I've I got to be clean. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. He preaches Christ. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. There's his discipleship of Jesus, his apostleship. He's working signs and wonders, and he is preaching Jesus. He has left the deaconship of the church, and now he's out being a missionary. He's on the missionary route. But that's not all. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. But when they believed Philip's preaching these things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So there it is. There's his work. He's out preaching and teaching the gospel. Alright, uh, verse number... 26. This is all about Philip. Now Philip is in a he's in a he's on a mission trip. He's, he's, he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are getting saved. And the angel of the Lord, verse 26, spank unto Philip. The angel, that's Jesus Christ before he was born in the Old Testament. Philip has got to be some, someone remarkable because here is the angel of the Lord speaking to him. Saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down to Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Philip, I want you to lead this great revival. <laughs> That's what he's telling him, Philip. Now your modern church missionary, your modern church pastor, he wouldn't leave because we've got such great numbers. I want to be of those numbers. <laughs> and he arose. Philip arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, 
and eunuch of great authority under Cadence the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of her treasures, had come to Jerusalem to worship. So Philip leads a complete city. And far as we see, only one man in the desert. And was returning, sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit sent unto Philip, there he is again, go near and join thyself. We know the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Guess who is leading, going to lead the Ethiopian eunuch to salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. The man that was preaching in Samaria, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Philip. Philip is still bringing people to Jesus. And he sees the angel of the Lord and the Holy Spirit saying, go join that man. Why? Because Philip has already been responsible for other people being brought to Jesus. And he said, the Spirit said, verse 30, and Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said to him, understand what thou readest? He said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of scripture where he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter like a lamb dumb before his shearers. So he opened not his mouth. That's Isaiah 53, 7. And his humiliation and judgment was taken away. Who, could, who shall declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. That's Jesus. And the eunuch said, answer Philip. Philip, this is our man. I pray thee of who speaketh the prophet of himself or some other man? That's a, that's a great question. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Philip is, is a knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures He's a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't preach anything but Jesus Christ. He doesn't bring in the nonsense. He left an entire city for one man. And we see only one man sitting in a chariot. Reading a gospel track. And the Holy Spirit has called Philip and he said. As they went their way they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said see here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Now verse 37 is removed from modern Bibles. Verse 37 removes what Philip says out of the Bible. What's wrong with modern Bibles? 37 is, this is what Philip said. The man says, I want to be baptized. Philip said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he said, answer, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Philip would not lead him into that water until he professed to know and believe Jesus Christ. I've been in a Baptist church here in Florida where a woman said, well, I've been baptized four times this year. And he baptized her in a fifth. That's not a Philip. Philip's like, okay, you want to get baptized? There's one requisition, and we looked at this before. There's one requisition for you to, you've got to believe Jesus Christ. That's what Philip said. Philip didn't get, all right, just say this prayer and then get in the water. Philip didn't say it. He explained, expounded Jesus Christ. So the, so the Ethiopian said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went both down into the water, uh, Philip and the unit. You know what's the problem with some of the baptism today? The pastor does not go down in the water either. Check out your baptism. Is it the baptizee that's only in the water? The Bible said Philip went down into the water with the Ethiopian eunuch. To have the person baptized to be baptized without the pastor getting away, that's not a Bible baptism. John the Baptist was in the water too, baptized him. When Jesus was baptized, John was in the water too. We're a Bible-believing church. Are you in the water with the person? If you're not, you're not following the Bible. What the Bible says, don't get angry with me. You get angry with God. 
So technically, thank God baptism is not a means of salvation, but only a testimony of salvation, because many of your Baptist churches don't do the baptism correctly. I was baptized, my wife Lisa was baptized, with the pastor standing outside the baptismal tank. And they got upset because Lisa's hair didn't go all the way under. Uh, I read the Bible, you only got upset that the pastor wasn't in the water either. But let's move on. So they both went, Philip and Eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he returned unto his rejoicing. And Philip was found in Athos, passing through and preaching through all the city. Philip was kind of raptured there at the moment in that water. But, I mean, this, the, the Holy Spirit of God led him somewhere else. Holy Spirit, okay, the Ethiopian eunuch got saved. All right, I got a job for you somewhere else. And transported him. This is the Philip. This is the Philip. Acts 21.8. So the great story of the Ethiopian eunuch, which we do quote and, and, and learn the scriptures of, that's the Philip we're looking at in John chapter 1. That Andrew went and brought to Jesus. Do you know that when that Ethiopian eunuch got saved through the use of Philip, that Andrew is also credited for Ethiopian salvation because Andrew brought Philip. When you take part in someone's salvation, and someone else gets saved by your work of getting somebody saved, get right. You get part of that inheritance. You get part of the reward. Andrew gets credit through the Ethiopian eunuch. Because Andrew's the one that brought Philip. Woe be if you don't go witness and don't tell anybody about Jesus, and your friend gets saved and they get out there telling people about You get no credit. You didn't try to bring Jesus. Whether you plant or you water, God gives an increase, but the, the planter and the water get part of the fruits. So not only are we looking at Philip, but we're also looking at Andrew. So Acts 21, verse 8. Okay, go back one page. Right there. Acts 21, 8. And the next day we were in Paul's company. This would be Luke writing. Departed and came to Caesarea. And we enter into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven. One of the seven one. Run that back to, to Acts chapter 6. One of the seven deacons. Yeah, deacons. And they abode with him. And the same man, Philip, had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. That's interesting because they say we don't have no prophets. There's four girls that are prophesying. And we're late in the book of Acts. But Philip, he's a deacon, and guess what? Now he's an evangelist. Where did we see evangelized? We saw him evangelizing back in Acts chapter 8. He was in Samaria, he went to the Ethiopian eunuch, and then he went to Azos. This guy's moving all around in evangelistic service by God, the Holy Spirit. And now he's in uh, uh, Caesarea, but he's going, we've already read about, he's going all around and he's trained his children to go out and preach the gospel and preach Jesus Christ. Now do you dare to take many of the, of the deacons of the churches today, the Baptist churches alone, you, would you believe that you would find those deacons out there witnessing and telling people about Jesus Christ and leading their children to walk in Christ? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. But that's Philip. That's who we're studying. So it means a lover of horses. Now he's, Matthew 14, 3, not to be confused with, Matthew 14, verse 3. Don't get him confused with this Philip. 
If this is not the fillet we're looking at, Matthew 14, 3. For Herod, that's Roman, laid hold on John the Baptist and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias, say, his brother Philip's wife. Now there's a Philip that's a brother to Herod who's married to this woman who Herod marries his, his, his brother's wife and then, you know, John the Baptist is beheaded. But Herodias' husband's name was Philip. Don't get that Philip mixed up with the Philip, the disciple, the apostle, the deacon, the evangelist, who also led his, his, his children to serve the Lord. Don't get that mixed up. So let's see what we got. Ooh, okay, back to John 1. So we go all the way back to John chapter 1. Verse 45. And Nathaniel will pick up later, Lord, Lord willing, next week. And we should close out chapter 1. Should. Ooh, look at it. So, Philip, verse, chapter 1, verse 45. Philip, there he is, findeth Nathaniel and says to him, We have found him. So there's Philip already in the beginning, before the Ethiopian Union, before the evangelist, before he's a deacon. He has been invited by Andrew to meet the Messiah. He believes Jesus Christ. And here he is, you know what he's doing? He's going out and finding others and bringing them to Jesus. And he, you don't read anywhere where Andrew said, come to my church. You don't see Philip say, come to Jesus. Invite you to someday with Jesus. You don't see that in the Bible. They walk up to their family and friends. They say, we found the Messiah. And then, boom, they start quoting the scripture. They start telling it as it is. Andrew didn't invite the little boy to Sunday school. The little boy was already there. Andrew turned to Jesus, hey, we've got a boy here already. He's got, look, he's got kind of, you know, giving the boy food up. He's got bread and, and fish. Hey, here's a boy right there. He's got bread and fish. He didn't invite him to the church. He was already there. So Philip finds Nathaniel and says unto him, we have found him. We, including Philip, including Simon, including Andrew, of whom Moses, the law, in the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all the prophets, did write, Jesus of Nazareth, okay, there, he, he, he wasn't born in Nazareth, but that's where he lived his childhood. That's where Joseph and Mary Ended up living, Nazareth. The son of Joseph. Well, he's actually the son of God, but the, the records in genealogy, Joseph. So here is Philip. He walks up, he walks up to Nathaniel and he says, You know what? Come to church. No, nope, he didn't say that. He says, You know what? We found a man named Jesus. Okay, yes, yeah, so what? Moses and the prophets say that he is the one, the Messiah. Philip to have to, would have to know the scriptures like Paul knew the scriptures, say, this belongs to that man Jesus right there. You know why many Christians won't go out and witness? Because they don't study the word of God, and they will be made a shame. Hey, listen, you know, there were many times witnessing, there been many years I've been witnessing, there are many times I were made ashamed. There was a time that the Jehovah Witnesses put me to shame. And then I went home and studied it out. And I got the answer. I take where I am made ashamed publicly witnessing, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. I did not know enough. 
the devil won for a while, you get in the Bible and say, next time I deal with somebody like that, I'm going to know the answer. And then you grow. You learn that the stove is hot. When mama tells you, don't touch it, and you go and touch it, ah, yeah, guess what? I'm not going to do that again. Philip tells Nathaniel, and he will tell the people in the book of Acts the scriptures because he doesn't have the New Testament scriptures. He will go about and say, Moses and the prophets point to that Jesus is the Christ, is the one. He knows about the prophets that when that Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah 53, Philip already knows what Isaiah 53 is all about. That's why the Holy Spirit chose them. He didn't, he didn't choose anybody who come to church. He chose the men who studied the scriptures and found the scriptures out. I've had that with, with, the, with God, with Jehovah Witness, that God brought me Jehovah, and I put them to shame. I had that happen Saturday. Jehovah's woman come up to me. She goes, I got some, I got some stuff that you can give to people. They got questions about the Bible. And I'm saying in the back of my head, and I, I looked at the information she gave me, or was going to give me. And I, I, I said, well, do you know that Jesus is God? Well, no, he's not. Okay, I know who you are. And we went about it. And I went, my familiar... Thomas said, my Lord, my God. And I showed her. She walked away saying, I'm going to go look at that in my Bible and study that. But she didn't give me her information. God knows I've studied the scripture enough and not enough. I can send him into the battlefield. And he's going to pull that sword out and he's going to use that sword correctly. I, I, I ain't going to say, well, come to my church and look to me. No, God don't use them people. I'm sorry. Because you got a bunch of sheep sitting in church Sunday morning getting fed goat food and not sheep food. And they're starving to death. Nathaniel, I mean, uh, uh, Philip goes up to Nathaniel and says, the scripture said, Moses and the prophets, that Jesus is that prophet that they spoke of. I'll bring you to him. I'll show you him. I didn't, I'm not going to bring you to my preacher, even though Jesus is to preach. I ain't going to bring you to my church. There is no church yet. Jesus Christ hadn't suffered and died. Now, we get a couple things with Nathaniel. Verse 46. And Nathaniel said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, Nazareth must have a reputation. Philip says, here is the Messiah. Nathaniel's like, <coughs> out of Nazareth? That'd be like me saying, hey, you know, we got a great Bible-believing church. Where? Daytona Beach, Florida. Daytona Beach, you mean where you had the bikers, where you got, you know, the, the spring breakers, and you got half naked women running around? That's there's a good Bible believing church. That would be my reaction. Because I've seen all the churches, most of the churches in Daytona Beach. They're wrong. But Nazareth has got such a thing that that Nathaniel's like, Philip, you're a good man, but nothing comes out of it. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Now, Nathaniel did not know his scriptures. Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Take your Bibles. 2 Kings 14.25. 2 Kings 14.25. Any, anything good come out of Nazareth? Second Kings fourteen twenty. You're going to learn something now. I don't know. I don't know how many people know this. Well, I would assume quite 
less. I mean, this is not something out of the air, like, oh. But th this is worth writing down. 1 Kings 14.25. So I'm going to show you something. And then I'm going to show you something, and I don't know where it goes, okay? But it, it's something quite interesting, what we've already read, looked at. 14.25, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of payment unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord of Israel, which he spanked by the hand of, you know who that is? The Jonah of the son of Amadai? That's Jonah, the book of Jonah. The whale vomit guy. Jonah who died in the whale and went to hell. I want to make sure you know that. Jonah did not live in the whale. He died in the whale. Jonah died in the whale and went to hell. I hope you got that. That's Jonah. The book of Jonah. There he is. You know who Jonah is, don't you? Mm -hmm. All right. Jonah, the son of Amatai, the prophet, which was of Gath, Hefer. I think something would be in a dentist's office. Gath, Hefer. All right. Gath, Hefer is five miles from Nazareth. So when Nathan, when Nathan L. said, Does there anything good that came out of Nazareth? Yeah, Jonah. Jonah came seven miles, or excuse me, five miles out of uh, Nazareth. That's interesting. Jonah. All right, go to Matthew 12 again. I, I don't know where this goes. I'm, I'm going to show you it. And... Something weird. Something weird. Weird enough the scriptures, I don't know. I'll make a comment, but I, I can't point it fully. But Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. And we said this about Simon Peter's father. Matthew 12, 39. And he answered, Jesus answered, and said to him, An evil adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall be no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. That's Jonah. That's Jonas in the New Testament. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, okay, we know who we're talking about. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah had to die because Jesus died. And if the church teaches that Jonah did not die, they're not a Bible-believing church. Well, make sure you got that. Because I know a Bible-believing church where the man got up, two men got up and taught that Jonah was alive. That's wrong. I heard that. But Peter's father's name, we just did in John chapter 1, is Jonah. Old Testament would be Jonas. Go back to John chapter 1. And I don't know where to go with this. And I don't want to say anything that could be wrong. And verse 46, John 1, 46. And we're done. John 1, 46. Nathan said, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, Jesus has came out of Nazareth. Amen. So did Jonah. And Jonah died and went to hell three days and three nights. Jesus will die and go to hell three days and three nights. And we're in, we're in the Gospel of John chapter 1. And we see that Jesus will say later on that Jonah will be a type of his death, burial, and resurrection. And already, the scriptures have brought us to a man that is of Nazareth, like Jesus was of Nazareth, and both these men die and go into hell three days and three nights. I don't know where to relate that, but there it is. And if you're going to teach that Jonah did not die, that he survived in the cavity of the whale, and he didn't go to hell, which I've heard many churches preach, mm -hmm. you are defying the death, death, the the. the you are defying the suffering, the death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You are a cult. And even from John chapter 1, 
we see Jonah. I don't know where to put that. I don't know how to put that. Nathan Hill said, well, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah, Jonah did. And Jesus came out of Nazareth. And Jonah is a book that is unbelieved by the scholars, unbelieved by churches. It is actually called a fairy tale. And if I had my Scorpio Bible, if I would read the note to you, the note said it is the most unbelievable story by most people. They think it's a made-up fairy tale story. Well, then so is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, because Jesus said, as Jonas was in the whale, uh, the, uh, the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be in, in the heart of the earth. And next week we're going to look at verse 47, hopefully to 51. But leaving off verse 46, Nathan now says to, to Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Well, come and see. Now Philip invites Jesus. I mean, invites Nathan out to Jesus after he witnessed to him. You say, Sally, have you ever brought people to church? Yeah, after I witnessed to him. I didn't bring them to church to beat to the pastor to witness. When I brought my dad to church, I witnessed to him many times. When I brought my father-in-law to church, I witnessed him many times. There's only one person I ever brought to church. It was my wife? She wasn't my wife. It was my wife to be Lisa. I brought her to the pastor of the church for one reason. I was going to ask her to marry her. Ask her to marry me. I did not want her to put her trust in Jesus because of me. Now she didn't know I was going to ask. I asked, well, she may have known. I brought her to the pastor of the church for the aspect was I wanted to make sure she was going to trust Jesus truly as her Savior. It wasn't because of me. It was because she was being brought for Jesus alone. Other than that, I've never told anybody, well, just come to church. I've witnessed to him first. Now, coming to, is it wrong? No, it's not wrong. But it also can't be an excuse. Not when we have gospel tracts. Because Philip is used by a man who evidently had some part of the scripture, had some part of Isaiah 53 in his chariot that Philip was able to use. But there are many Christians today, with Isaiah 53, with any of the Gospels, they still couldn't lead anybody to Jesus Christ because they don't study the Scriptures themselves. That's a shame. That's where the Bible says, Study to show thyself the fruit unto God, a workman that need not to be shamed, rightly divine the word of truth. We've got to go out there. The, Jesus said, Go in all the world and preach the Gospel. Now, right now, churches are preaching, Go in all to the ballot boxes and vote for Republicans. That's what's being said today. Okay? The last months, go and vote Republican. No, Jesus said, go in all the world and preach the gospel. Now what does it say? Go and, re re go and vote Republican, but bring your family, bring your, your, your friends, bring your co-workers to church Sunday morning. That's not what the scriptures say. You are training your church members to be lazy. And then you wonder why they don't come out on visitation. Just bring them Sunday morning. That's a shame. That's a shame. Lord God the Father, I just thank you for your word, Lord God. And I just thank you for your truth. And thank you, Lord, you've given me the ability to go out and tell people. I'm not ashamed. Lord God, just thank you for Louise, Lord, she gets gospel tracts out and she has that love for you, Lord. And Lord God, just help us as a family, Lord. For Jesus' sake, we pray. And Lord, just pray for uh, tomorrow's farmer's market, Lord. And yeah. Roberto, Lord God, get them out of that Catholic church and get them into the Word. Yeah. And get them saved and get them living for you, Lord. For Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen.